Good morning, everyone. We're going to be talking about obeying God, doing his will, and also we're going to be living about how we could live, have fear for, for God. That means respecting him and doing his will, walking in his ways. We turn to John, I mean Deuteronomy chapter 10, reading verses 10, 30, 13, 12 and 13, please. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good, Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back from Mexico. And uh, yes, our VBS team survived. It was a long week. They worked tirelessly. They worked very hard. And, uh, and we got through it. And I'm sure that probably Chad feels the same way with Ben Goff. So. And also to the construction crew that worked for True North Helping Hands. Uh, I think they probably worked a little bit harder than we did, so I think that they uh, deserve some credit as well. So. so welcome, everyone. Welcome to those who are at home. Welcome to any of you who are here visiting with us this morning. Uh, we're glad to have you. And I thought I would start off with a little update. Everybody's always asking me, oh, you know, what's happening with the house? And the answer is always the same, nothing, nothing, nothing. And so I was thinking of what um, Dwight Dwayne was saying, you know, the season, the season of negativity, the season of doubt. Well, this weekend, uh, Che and I worked at uh, an offer that we had on the house. So we do have a firm offer on the house right now. We had some hiccups. It was the same couple. We dealt with them twice before, and the deal fell through at their end with their house. But now the deal is firm for their house, and the deal is firm for our house. So we have water test on Monday and uh, house inspection sometime this week. So... Let's hope there's no hiccups. So, so uh, and we also have a closing date for August 30th. So whether it's August 30th or before that, Che will be here. So actually the timing is pretty good because Jay and Linda and Che will all get here around the same time and we can move forward and just get busy. So my lesson this morning, priorities, priorities. And I'm sure you probably have an idea of what I'm going to talk about, but I'm probably going to surprise you a little bit. So, my lesson this morning will touch a little on stuff that Miles talked about a few weeks ago in his lesson, and uh, some of it will sound somewhat similar, but is different. And so he talked about spiritual decision making, and spiritual decision making and priorities go hand in hand, and we need to have priorities. And so, I see something horrible going on in the Lord's Church. When I say Lord's Church, I'm not referring to specifically this congregation but just the Lord's Church in general. And that is that a lot of congregations, the Lord's Church, a lot of people in the Lord's Church don't have the kind of respect and reverence for God that they should. And so too many things are distracting us. Too many things are pulling us away from God. And some of those things are materialism, individualism, technology, Think about technology. Everybody's getting caught up with the latest technology. Entertainment and more, etc. There are a lot of things that distract us. A lot of things that pull us away from God. So am I saying that watching movies and TV shows is wrong? Or buying the latest cell phone is wrong? Well, of course not. But if we live for these things, if these are the things that occupy all our time, if these are the things that we need to get us through our day, more than we need God, then it's something that we need to examine. It's something that we have to take a good hard look at. Some things take up a lot of our time. Some things can shape our thinking and our desires without us realizing it, such as movies and TV shows and various things. And they can change our morals and our values. They can change the way we think about spiritual matters. And so, are we going to allow ourselves to be taught about morals and values from the world or shouldn't we be taught by God instead from whom morality comes from? 
So something to think about. Shouldn't we also be trying to please God instead of ourselves? Take a look, if you will, at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, and then I'll go down a little farther. And I don't have a set text for this lesson. I just have various passages of scripture that will go with the topic of priorities. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10 say this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. I want to emphasize that last sentence. And find out what pleases the Lord. And then down in verses 15 to 17 of that same chapter. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Again, try to find out what the Lord's will is. Try to please the Lord. We see the same thing coming out, and out over and over again. So in, <coughs> in uh, the book of Romans, we have been studying that. And this has been quoted very often. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we're talking about priorities. We're talking about not letting ourselves be distracted by the things of this world. And so, pleasing God is our top priority. Now, the word priority means something that is regarded or seen as more important than another. So let me say that again. The word priority means something that is regarded or seen as more important than another. So it means putting something first above other things, believing that it's more important. That's what we do. We have priorities. We put some things more important than other things. And so God must be our priority in life. He has to be seen as more important than anything else. He has to be first above everyone and everything. And you have to ask yourself, are we doing that? Are we doing that? So let me give you three examples to talk about, to show about how we allow priorities to change in our lives. So let me give you the first example. Example number one, vacation. You plan this nice vacation in the Bahamas or maybe some European country. Or, for, for example, Che and I, we go to Singapore for vacation, and that's because her family's there. So we go there to visit her family. So you plan ahead. You think of things you can do while you're there. You think of nice tourist attractions to see. Maybe you plan for some time spent at the beach. Maybe you plan to do some kayaking, canoeing, hiking, Darwin, fishing. Perhaps you intend to go to the opera or some musical festival. But whatever you decide to do or see, you make plans for it ahead of time. We all do. We, we have a vacation. We make plans. We try to to map things out, what we're going to do on our vacation. So now when you go away for vacation, do you plan ahead to see if there's a congregation of the Lord's Church so you can attend? Vacation doesn't mean we get a break from God and his people. And are we guilty of doing this? When we plan for vacation, do we plan to find a congregation so that we don't miss worship? So that we can be there with God's people, that we can worship together. When Che and I go to Singapore, I'm there. Every Sunday, there's a congregation there, the Lord's Church, and we meet there. And I do not miss. And we cannot miss. We are members of the Lord's Church. We are part of his family. You are family. We're all family. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, tells us, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And that day is referring to when Jesus will come back for all of us. So there is a point. Jesus arranged things the way that he did so that we might be able to encourage one another every Lord's Day until Jesus comes back. We need to be with the saints. We need to be with God's people every Lord's Day, every Sunday. And vacation doesn't change that. <laughs> example number two. I've used this example before previously about late night, staying up too late the night before. 
You planned an evening activity with friends. Before you realized it, the time had passed away quickly, and you see 1.30, 2 o'clock, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're like, <gasps> so, and you get to bed. And you stay up so late that you convince yourself to stay home and not go out for worship. We wouldn't do this when it comes to our careers, our jobs, would we? I used to work at a mattress factory, and I remember times where I felt exhausted and I didn't feel like going in. But I would drag myself out of bed, and I would drag myself to work. Why? Because I had bills to pay, and I knew it. It was a priority. I had to be there. I had bills. And so, does God deserve more from us, considering he's the one that gives us our jobs? He's the one that gives us the money that we have. Doesn't he deserve more? It's one day a week. And if you want to get real technical about it, it's only a few hours on that one day. We're not even worshiping for the entire day together. We're just here for the morning and evening for those who come in the evening. So it's not too much to ask to drag ourselves out of bed and be here for the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 say this. After I find it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 24 to 25 and then chapter 3 verses 9 to 13 say this a man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work this too I see is from the hand of God for without him who can eat or find enjoyment so we understand that what we have comes from God our jobs our income you know, the entertainment, the good life that we have comes from God. And then in chapter 3, verses 9 to 13. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. And so, these things come from God. And so we need to put God first. There has to be priority. You're tired out Saturday night? Drag yourself out for worship anyway. Be here for the Lord. He deserves that much. And so we need to show God the respect and thanksgiving he deserves and make the effort to be here on his day Remember, it's the Lord's day. It's his day. We need to be here. Meeting on the Lord's day needs to be a priority. And finally, example number three. And I titled this one, Purchase versus Offering. Purchase versus Offering. So you might say, okay, what's he talking about here? Well, we see something we want, we just have to have it. So maybe it's the latest cell phone, maybe it's a collector's edition, some movie series or something, or TV series, or perhaps it's something antique but very valuable, and you see it, and you got to have it. We convince ourselves that we are buying it. We say, i got to have it, I'm buying it. That's all there is to it. And then Sunday, com Sunday comes, the Lord's Day comes, and we put $2 or $5 in the collection plate. In our minds, we tell ourselves, we just don't have the money. We don't have the money because of the money we spent on our purchase. Well, what came first? A desire to please God or a desire to please ourselves? What was the priority? Did we put God first or did we put ourselves first? Think about it. Do we convince ourselves that what we did was okay? And sometimes we do. We say, ah, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Do we think of the scripture that says to give whatever's in our hearts to give and then tell ourselves, see, it doesn't tell us how much we're supposed to give. We're free to give whatever we want. Well, some of us have probably been guilty of that. But what kind of message did we send to God? What is God going to think? Did we think of God when we made our decision? What was our priority? God should not have been an afterthought. This is what one preacher told me, that God should not be an afterthought, remembering him and our offering only after we've paid all our bills and bought the things that we want. And sometimes that's what we do. We're guilty of this. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Listen to what Jesus says here. And this is such a great story. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offering were put 
and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So I'm not telling you to put everything you have to live on in the collection plate. But Jesus makes a very good point. She thought of God first. She showed her thankfulness to God by her offering, by what she had put in. 2 Timothy chapter 6. In 2 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. Or actually, 1 Timothy, sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 19. Listen to what Paul said to Timothy. And he gives him some instructions here. And listen to this. He says, Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God provides everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So we may not be millionaires, but we are all richer than we think. And God expects us to be rich in good deeds and lay up treasure for ourselves in heaven. And that doesn't mean we can't buy nice things for ourselves. It just means we need to make God and our offering a priority. We need to think of God in our offering. Our offering every Lord's Day is part of our worship to God and needs to take greater priority than our desires. Think about it when Sunday comes, Lord's Day, make sure you put that money aside, what you have in your heart, what you intend to give. Don't spend it before the Lord's Day comes. Have that ready. So when we think of how our attitude should be and where our priorities should be, I want us to consider and think about Jesus. And I enjoyed the Lord's Supper talk because this is going to touch on a little bit of what Dwayne said. Think of Jesus, the one we claim to follow. So think about this, priorities, think about Jesus. Well, Jesus went through a lot for us. Throughout the book of John, he repeatedly stated that he came to do the work for which the Father sent him to do, which was to come and die and save the people of the world, including you and me. And that was what Jesus came to do. But before Jesus died, he faced a lot of things. Think about this. He dealt with family members that didn't believe in him. Imagine. Here he comes, he, he, he deals with family members that don't believe in him. Even though he did miracles in his hometown, the people rejected him. A miracle right in front of them, and they still rejected him. John chapter 1, verse 11 says that Jesus came to that which was his own, his people, the Jews, but his own did not receive him. So imagine, he comes to those who are his people, they reject him. He was betrayed by Judas, one of the twelve apostles, whom he chose to share his life with. He was also betrayed by Peter, who was very close to Jesus, who said, I don't know him. Peter's own words, I don't know him. He was ridiculed by Roman soldiers. He was spat upon. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was insulted. He allowed himself to go through that at the hands of Roman soldiers, those who are not his people. He, after all this, all his kindness, he was betrayed by the people he came to love and save and they said, crucify him. He suffered on the cross while people walked by laughing at him. According to Matthew 27, 41 to 43, the chief priests, teachers of the law, and the elders of the Jews mocked him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Think about all that he went through. It's not just his death on the cross. It's everything that led up to his death on the cross. All the suffering that he went through. Everything that he put himself through for you and I. The Son of God came down to earth to walk as a human, to be ridiculed, to be beaten, to be betrayed by those closest to him. And he came to willingly die for the people of this world. And he knew ahead of time that this was all going to happen. You imagine, if you knew ahead of time what was going to happen to you, would you go through with it? Would you actually do it? 
In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So Jesus willingly did all of this. That means he willingly put himself through everything he faced for you and I. And he never gave up. He never stopped. He could have called thousands of angels to come and rescue him, to help him. He could have said, I don't need this aggravation. He could have said a lot of things, just said, no, I'm not going to do it. But he didn't. He didn't do any of that. Instead, he finished what he came to do, even though it must have been extremely discouraging at times. Can you imagine knowing just before something's going to happen, that's going to happen, how discouraged you would be? It's like, okay, I have to go through this. I know it's going to happen. It has to play out. Can you imagine what it would be like? The Son of God died for us, and he did so because he wanted to please his Heavenly Father. He made that his priority. You see, Jesus set the example. Jesus made God his priority. The Lord of all creation who created both you and I deserves more from us. He deserves our full devotion. He deserves our love. He deserves to be praised, respected, and worshipped. And he deserves to be put first in all that we do. Let me just read the reading that we had this morning once again, but just verse 12. I don't have to read both verses, but listen to what was told to the people in the past, the Israelites. And now, O Israel, now what I want you to do is I want you to think about this. We are the new Israel, the spiritual Israel. So think of us as I say this. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We're talking about priority. So let me finish this lesson with a challenge. Are you putting God first? Are you really putting God first? Examine yourselves and make God your priority in all that you do. If you are here today, if you've not heard and responded to the gospel, the good news, then that is your priority. And won't you do that today? It's the difference between life and death. If you are here today, you haven't responded to the gospel, please, won't you come down? Won't you come speak to me or someone else here that you know and trust? Hear the good news and respond to it by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's stand and sing our last song of the morning. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where